of how do you deliver a really clear message in a very short time, one minute. And then you'll have, have a good time to work on that with your message box, a quick practice with each other, and then you'll have a chance to come up and present to Julia what your idea is. Now, not everybody has something for the Washington Post. So we're expanding the, the challenge to say, you could also make it uh, what you might want to say to your congressman, or what you might just want to say to describe who you are, what you do and why it matters at a cocktail party while you're in DC and are schmoozing. So you can pick what you end up deciding to do your message on, but you still want to deliver it in a clear way. And the three really important rules of communication that Steve Schneider taught me were know my audience, know my self, know my stuff. So you don't want to think about who your audience is. And so for starters, Julia is going to tell us just a little bit about window into her world and how it is she's led here with a bunch of us in the ocean today. Thanks so much. So yes, and so I think again, because it sounds like a lot of often when Nancy and I are doing this, we're talking to scientists and scientists generally trying to, you know, talk either to get their story written by a journalist primarily that's where I can enter it sometimes like they're talking to long videos. But for you guys, particularly if you're working at an NGO, what's just important is that you can succinctly explain what you're doing and why it matters. Try to think about it from the three points you made, and the product you made, you have to boss on in, let them know what you do and why it matters, and ultimately, potentially, what you think they should be doing about it. Of economic scarcity right now is sequestration. So to say, I've got a great idea, and I only need $300 million to pull it off, is probably a conversation to kill. So, you know, trying to think when you are even describing what you're doing, uh, to really keep in mind what are the ways that you can kind of make it possible for whoever you're talking to to help you. What is going to keep their interest? Sometimes, and I mentioned again, kind of putting a limbs and things like that, is you can say, you know, I've got an incredible video on this that you might want to see, or, you know, I've taken amazing pictures of what's going on here. Sometimes even little things like that, teasers like that, are something that people get, again, uh, a journalist interested or, you know, Or, you know, on your local television station the next day does not mean that you 
haven't succeeded in peaking someone's interest. So just also you have to think about that, about being in there for the longer call and not just, you know, kind of focusing on the industry of What Rules do you have the same wealth that scientists do? You suffer the curse of too much knowledge. You know a lot about what you're passionate about, right? You love the details. But you're trying to deal with audiences who are not the same place. And Cameron says, I don't know why I don't care about the bottom of the ocean, but I do. <laughs> One of my favorite is the bottom of wine. Or the most important thing is, that's what their ears are, are just waiting and yearning to hear from. Fish banks are like savings accounts that use compound interest at 
Fisher study users could enjoy without completing the principle. Nice. He was talking their language. Okay. So, I'm just going to give you a very quick little sample of a recent uh, place where a couple of young scientists that I work with at this place called NCs, where people come together to work on projects, and they were working on marine debris. All these scientists came together, and the two, these two young folks from, um, this is Mark Brown and Chelsea Rowan, decided that they wanted to get out a message from the research they were doing about marine debris. And in a nutshell, what they want to say is, we believe that countries classify the most harmful plastics as hazardous. Their environmental agencies would have the power to restore affected habitats and intent, prevent more dangerous debris from accumulating. So that was what they wanted to achieve. And they worked really hard at what their messages were going to be. And here, you don't have to read this. I don't expect you to read it. The point is simply that they not only did one message box, but they did message boxes thinking about if I was talking to the U.S., what would be the points of, what would be the backup information I would be able to make this compelling? What would it be if I'm talking to policymakers in, in the EU, you know, et cetera, et cetera, in the States? And with an incredible amount of blood, sweat, and tears, having really nailed their messages, they wrote a pitch to Nature Magazine and convinced them to let them write this thing called comment, which is like, uh, is like an opinion piece. And what they did with this was then communicated to the media when it came out. And it really was an opinion piece with an assembly of all of their data. This is Mark, I love this quote. The plastic industry's never been regulated properly. They're a bit fairer, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> They got a lot of media coverage. And what happened was that the EPA contacted them. And now, they're, because it's like, you know, you do something, anything you do, especially with the media, it's like dropping a pebble in a pond, and all these ripples go out. And in fact, they opened all these new discussions at EPA regarding this whole topic. And I think it's just so marvelous because they are really two young people who are just idealistic and really went for it. And it was a very high bar that they managed to achieve. So I find that really inspiring. Okay, so we want to get to you soon. This. So I'm gonna, uh, this is another one I'm just going to really move through. But the point of this one was another young scientist, it's not a marine example, but she was going to do some research in the Amazon. This is Jennifer Walsh. And she did her message box. And it's not a purpose in the message box, but what's important is she wrote a pitch to journalists. And she used her message box to think about what was the pitch she wanted to get across. And then she crafted her language around what she knew she needed to make. And we don't really have time to go into this, but can you see what the headline is on this? Yeah. The, the subject is scientists burning down the council. Well, I'm just going to say, Juliet, if you saw that, in here, what happens to you when you open your email, email on a typical morning? Right, you know, you've got tons of emails, so that's the kind of thing you really get a crowd. You're going to delete, 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 right? <laughs> this one you might open. Exactly. Okay. So, anyways, all I want to, I, we don't have time to look into this, but I wanted to show you that the economist ended up doing a story and they lifted her exact language out of that email. And it's in the story. So it's really important that you think about crafting those sound bites that are you know, the exact thing you know that will make it stick to your memory. Any physical testing simply by building mathematical models, which would save a huge amount of money. And I'm very concerned about this because why is this important? Because so many whales and marine animals will be completely damaged. They depend upon their hearing to find food, to mate, and this whole process is very destructive. It's going to be very expensive. I, if, if you don't have the, you know, that, this, this is just too theoretical and too spent. So, because again, it's like, I know these issues, of course it's cheap. There's no question that it would be cheaper to do this mathematically than it would be to do it. But if you can't tell me, like, there's this person at MIT, and this person knows that they could actually, they can, you know, 
they know how sound travels, they're capable of doing this, et cetera, et cetera. If you don't have that, this is not a story. And it's not, it's not, and, and it, wouldn't, it also wouldn't have a policy maker say, well, if you could figure out who was an environmentally minded mathematician who could, you know, could be a source and could say, I can make a of doing it, then that's one thing. But I, I don't feel like we are happy to leave that, because otherwise it's just, it's an issue, not a story. Issue, not a story. Okay. And not and, and, and not a policy argument because you don't have to pass. Okay. Okay. Nitrogen that's built fertilizer on lawns because uh, that's something we can fix. And it turns out that the fertilizer companies can kind of be able to put down five times as much as they need to. So I would like there to be a motion to have us be better stewards. And uh, do one fifth of the amount of fertilizers. We have green grass and clean water. Respect the setbacks, and, and maybe at the time they could also say that they must use slow release nitrogen. My feedback would be: I feel like what's, what's helpful. Uh, you know, the, the issue of algae blooms and nitrogen runoff is something that's been written about many times. So my question is: you know, what what is it here? Again, to say that there have been straight bass dead and, and a horseshoe crab again. You know, this happens every year, I guess, partially I would say, you know, is it, you know, are the first course? So, to me, off, off, off topic, but yes. this doesn't happen. Okay, so that's, first of all, that's helpful that you need to put that in. Like, this has never happened before. It's never been documented that there's been an algae off the Cape Cod. Dan Pass, they all know algae. Now it's done. Okay, so one thing that's to say right. is, right. So one thing is to say that this is the year that the yes. strike has been done. I did find the thing that I found most interesting about your pitch was the idea that, uh, you know, that fertilizer companies are, are the idea that they're